A little while ago I published a short overview video on Antoine Henri Yumini, a Swiss military officer who served as a general in the French and Russian armies and wrote a treatise on war that was influential in the US Civil War and beyond. This video has been popular so I wanted to follow it up with a more in-depth look into his ideas. From Yumini's perspective, wars are started by politicians based on a number of different motivations. Each of these had their own reasons and risks. In this video, we will be examining the first five of Yumini's views on statesmanship and war as he described them in the first chapter of his book, The Art of War. In a follow-up video, we will consider the other five points he raised, so subscribe so you don't miss it. Let's jump right in with the first item on Yumini's list, an offensive war to reclaim rights. He saw this as the most just type of war, believing that nations have a legitimate right to reclaim lost territories or stolen property. However, he also considered that reclaiming rights needed to be proportional to the harm suffered and also needed to serve a greater good of a nation. Before resorting to war, Yomini advocated for exhaustive diplomatic efforts and negotiation to peacefully resolve the points of contention. He believed that many such situations could be handled without violence if the parties involved were willing to work out mutually agreeable solutions. He urged statesmen to never glorify war or view it as anything other than a necessary evil, undertaken as a last resort. Should war begin, Yomini was adamant that there must be clear and achievable goals and a high probability of success. Vague objectives to achieve victory, like a desire for justice, often result in open-ended conflicts and worse. He considered launching an offensive without a strong chance of victory as irresponsible and potentially disastrous. Yumini emphasized meticulous planning and careful risk assessment to ensure minimal resource expenditure. As with all wars, he prioritized minimizing casualties and economic strain on the nation. Second on the list, we will consider war that is defensive politically but offensive militarily. In Yomini's eyes, war often presented this fascinating paradox of political and military objectives. This seemingly contradictory stance stemmed from his nuanced understanding of both statecraft and battlefield tactics. Yomini prioritized maintaining political legitimacy and international support. Initiating a war, even one perceived as defensive, could damage a nation's image and alienate potential allies. This is one reason why he advocated for exhausting all diplomatic avenues before resorting to armed conflict. Engaging in proactive negotiations and demonstrating a willingness for compromise strengthened a nation's moral high ground and weakened the aggressor's position. Yomini saw defensive wars as reactive, responding to a direct threat to a nation's territory or sovereignty. This reactive stance helped garner sympathy and support from other powers. This is something that we have seen in the current Russia-Ukraine war. On the battlefield, Yomini advocated for offensive tactics whenever possible, using maneuvers focused on exploiting enemy weaknesses, encircling forces, and striking at critical points to disrupt enemy plans and seize the initiative. He viewed defensive strategies as inherently passive and vulnerable. Holding static positions exposed forces to enemy bombardment and risked losing key terrain. This apparent contradiction between political defensiveness and military offensiveness was Yomini's way of advocating for strategic pragmatism. He recognized that while appearing defensive in the political arena could secure international support, victory ultimately hinged on effective military tactics. His approach aimed to balance the political and military realms to achieve a swift and decisive outcome with minimal damage to a nation's reputation and resources. In the third item on the list, we will consider Yomini's views on wars of expediency, conflicts waged for opportunistic gains. He considered them dangerous, destabilizing, and ultimately counterproductive for several reasons. Wars of expediency, fueled by greed and ambition, violated the principle of a just war, leading to unnecessary suffering and jeopardizing the moral standing of the aggressor. Yomini argued that short-term gains from opportunistic wars often had long-term detrimental consequences. The resentment and instability they provoked could lead to future conflicts, negating any initial benefits. He viewed them as a gambling approach to statecraft, risking greater losses than potential gains. Initiating wars for personal gain could sever valuable alliances and diplomatic ties. 
Yomini recognized the importance of international cooperation in maintaining peace and preventing costly wars. Actions driven by expediency could shatter this trust, leaving nations susceptible to isolation and increased vulnerability. Also, Yomini thought that wars of expediency could sow discord and dissent within a nation. Citizens weary of unnecessary conflict and suspicious of their leaders' motives might become restless and disillusioned, potentially leading to internal strife and weakening the nation from within. However, Yomini's disapproval of wars of expediency was not absolute. He acknowledged rare situations where preemptive action against an emerging threat, even an opportunistic one, might be necessary to avert a greater future catastrophe. But, he still emphasized the need for extreme caution and thorough calculation before even considering such drastic measures. The fourth point that Yomini discussed were his perspectives on conducting wars with or without allies. He saw both the strategic advantages and potential pitfalls of alliances. One advantage he saw to having allies was that they could significantly bolster military power, providing additional troops, resources, and strategic opportunities. As such, this could tip the balance of power in favor of the alliance and potentially shorten the duration of the war. Yomini also noted that the shared burden of the costs and risks of war could be distributed among allies, thus reducing the strain on any individual nation's resources and manpower and could alleviate economic and social pressures at home. Another benefit he saw allies bringing to the table was enhanced political legitimacy when creating a coalition against a perceived aggressor. This could strengthen a nation's international standing and garner additional support from neutral powers as well as further isolating and weakening the enemy. He also saw value in strategic coordination where allies could work together to develop military plans to take advantage of each other's strengths and plugging their individual weaknesses. However, Yomini also noted several disadvantages to having allies. Alliances could be hampered by conflicting goals and priorities among member states. This could lead to disagreements over strategy, resource allocation, and the war's objectives, potentially hindering its effectiveness. Yomini also warned that joining an alliance meant ceding some degree of strategic independence. Nations might have to adapt their plans to accommodate the needs and capabilities of their allies, potentially compromising their own optimal strategies. He also held concerns that some allies could prove unreliable, failing to contribute their promised resources or wavering in their commitment to the war effort, thus leaving other allies exposed and vulnerable. Another disadvantage Yomini mentioned was that there could be post-war complications. Dividing the spoils of victory and addressing the aftermath of war could create friction and resentment among allies. This could sow seeds of future conflict and undermine the initial benefits of the alliance. One example of this was the US versus Soviet Cold War in the aftermath of World War II. Yomini advocated for a pragmatic approach to alliances. He advised governments to carefully consider the potential advantages and disadvantages before entering into any alliance. In the fifth item on his list, wars of intervention, Yomini viewed them with a cautious realism, acknowledging their potential value while stressing the critical need for careful evaluation and responsible action. He saw a number of possible justifications for intervention. Yomini recognized the obligation to uphold alliances and intervene in conflicts to protect threatened allies. He considered this a legitimate reason for armed intervention, especially when a strong alliance served as a deterrent against larger threats. In his time in Napoleonic-era Europe, he saw intervention as a way of maintaining the balance of power. Yomini believed in a European political equilibrium where no single power should become dominant. He saw intervention as a tool to prevent any one nation from achieving undue influence and destabilizing the balance of power. Some political scientists later extended this thinking worldwide to the bilateral divide during the Cold War. With declining globalization now in play, the idea of regional power balancing is in vogue again with geopolitical strategists like Peter Zion. Yomini felt another justification was to intervention to stop internal strife or regional instability that could spill over and threaten neighboring countries. However, he stressed the importance of respecting national sovereignty and avoiding unnecessary interference in internal affairs. He also held that there were precursors to intervention. 
Yumini emphasized exhausting all diplomatic efforts before resorting to war. He saw negotiations, treaties, and alliances as preferable methods of resolving conflicts and maintaining peace. He also believed that intervention should serve a defined and attainable objective, not simply a vague desire for influence or expansion. He warned against pursuing interventions with unclear objectives. The US has fallen into this trap twice, once in Vietnam and more recently in Afghanistan. As with all wars, Yamini prioritized minimizing casualties and economic burdens. He advised against interventions that could drain a nation's resources and jeopardize its own stability. Also, he asserted that intervention required strong public support at home. Yumini understood that a nation divided by dissent could struggle to sustain a prolonged intervention and face internal vulnerabilities. Yumini further warned against underestimating the complexities and potential for escalation in interventionist wars. He cautioned against misjudging the enemy's strength, allies' reliability, and the unpredictable nature of war. He was also concerned that an unjustified intervention could damage a nation's international reputation and alienate potential allies. Also, public opinion could turn against prolonged or unsuccessful interventions, leading to domestic unrest. Another warning he emphasized was that wars of intervention could easily morph into quagmires, thus draining resources and manpower without clear paths to victory. Yomini advised against getting entangled in endless conflicts with no foreseeable end. Yomini's views on statesmanship and war still bear lessons for today's politicians. Even though things have changed a lot since the early 1800s, a lot of things still remain the same. National leaders today repeat the same mistakes that Yamini observed the leaders of his time making. I mentioned a few, can you think of other situations that align with his observations, either as mistakes made or conflicts avoided? Let me know what you think in the comments and subscribe so that you don't miss the follow-up discussion of Yamini's other 5 views on statesmanship and war. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please click the like button. And, check out our other videos on various philosophies and philosophers.